and now from the University of Virginia Center for Politics. Good afternoon and welcome to the UVA Center for Politics Global Perspectives on Democracy Programs Ambassador Series and the International Forum on Diplomacy. I'm Damon Irby, Director of Global Initiatives at the Center for Politics. Today, we are honored to host Ambassador Roya Rahmani, who served as Ambassador of Afghanistan to the United States from December 2018 until this past July. Afghanistan holds a special place in the hearts of those at the Center for Politics. We were honored to host three contingents of Afghan women during the summers of 2011 and 2012 who participated in the U.S. Department of State's U.S.-Afghanistan Professional Partnership Exchange. These amazingly successful women were serving in positions such as judges in the Supreme Court system, high officials in the Ministry of Women's Affairs and the Ministry of Education, leaders of NGOs, and many other high-level roles. My colleague Meg Hubeck and I traveled to Kabul during that time to follow up with the exchange delegates and learn more about their activities and their home environments. All involved in these exchanges believed they were impacting Afghanistan for the better. I can't express how disheartened we are by the current state of affairs in Afghanistan and have greatly anticipated your insight, Ambassador Rahmani, and to how we arrived where we are today, the current circumstances, and your vision and hope for the future. In addition to your service as Afghanistan's ambassador to the U.S., you also held the position of non-resident ambassador to Mexico, Argentina, and the Dominican Republic. Prior to these appointments, you served as Afghanistan's ambassador to Indonesia from 2016 through 2018. That you were the first woman to serve in each of these roles, along with many others, speaks volumes to your experience and expertise. Ambassador Rahmani now serves as a senior advisor at the Atlantic Council South Asia Center, a distinguished fellow at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, and as a senior fellow for international security at the New America Foundation. Earlier in your career, you were honored with the Best Human Rights Activist Award by the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission and were listed by Time Magazine in its 2019 100 Next list as a fierce advocate of peace on Afghan terms. So many amazing experiences and accomplishments. Uh, the news of you joining us has attracted numerous questions from our students. So after I ask a couple, the majority will be given directly by them. So Ambassador Rahmani, we thank you for the time you've given us today and for the dedication that you have towards Afghanistan's future. Thank you so much, Mr. Irby. It is a pleasure to be here. And it gives me hope uh, to hear that there has been interest in this session because simply it also demonstrates that there is interest in what's happening in my country and uh, to the future of the people of Afghanistan, in which you all have played an immense role uh, in a variety of ways over the past two decades. Over the past two decades, we have had a steep uh, curve of progress that we all traversed. We had major achievements, much of it that is not known to necessarily to many of the people who contributed to this. Uh, these, contrib these progress have been owed to the sacrifices that the Americans, the rest of the international community, alongside the major sacrifices that the Afghans made throughout these past 20 years. And the outcomes have been prevention of major security issues, as well as the progress made towards peace and stability, not only for Afghanistan, but for the region and globally. So now at this juncture, it does not look very hopeful, but I must say that I am hopeful that there would be change in the horizon. And that once again, with the persistence and perseverance, we would be able to, um, to, to uh, make use of the investments that we have made 
together over the past decades. That is important for the peace, security, prosperity, and well-being of all of us. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to a very lively discussion together with you all. Well, thank you so much. And we know that, that Afghanistan is much more than the bad news that we see on television. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to open by asking you what you love most about Afghanistan and its people. What are, what are some of the special characteristics of the people that you would like members of the University of Virginia community and all of our audience to know about? Well, thank you for that. Like you said, that unfortunately, the the what dominates the news is uh, uh, the incidences. It is uh, about what has gone wrong, basically, because that's that is that's what makes news in general. Uh, but um, to share some of the special characteristics of the Afghans, I must say that. Um, it is loyalty, it's hospitality, it is uh, the uh, very um, values that we uh, have uh, um, uh, internalized over centuries uh, towards uh, um, our responsibility in terms of a social contract, uh, the respect for the elderly, for our parents, the, that relationship is at the core of who, uh, what defines us. Let me give you an example of that. So it, it has been always a um, um, part of the tradition that when it is dinner time, Everybody in the household comes and sits together, even if they do not want to eat, even if they have uh, something before or they are not feeling like eating or something. But this is part of uh, that bond for the family that 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 uh, brings everybody and they need to talk and, and be present there. It would be considered. Uh, disrespectful to the parents if, if the children, for example, did not show uh, in the uh, around uh, the, the dinner table or, or the cloth that, that they would lay in on the ground and they all set to share dinner. So it uh, and also uh, what what is uh, very special in terms of the characteristic it is uh, cherished by a very uh, rich history that afghanistan has uh, the beauty uh, of its landscape uh, the literature and language which is very poetic somewhat indirect but it it goes into the core of the of what the communication style is and the delicacy that it can carry and convey. Sometimes a indirect uh, a metaphoric phrase could be enough motivational for, for groups of people, for masses, to encourage them to, to do something rather uh, than any kind of uh, ins other incentive uh, would probably bring. So um, it is a beautiful country. It, uh, the people uh, are uh, very um, loyal. They make good friends and they would uh, forever remember. And, and one of the, uh, I repeat, characteristics is that uh, in terms of hospitality, uh, hospitality uh, guests have always a very special place in Afghanistan. If you are a guest, you're protected. If you're a guest, you're honored. You, if you're a guest, uh, any the best of the, whatever a family could offer is for you. This is uh, something that uh, um, I uh, think uh, is not anymore uh, talked about and, and shared. Well, I have to share with you that um, we were treated wonderfully in Afghanistan. So we could spend an hour talking about it, um, but I, I just wanted to take this moment in the beginning to 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 let you speak about that. So I'd like to go now to our first uh, our first student who's with us today, Kareth Fern. Kareth, could you join us and uh, ask your question? Hi, Ambassador Ramani. Thank you so much for participating in this event today. My question for you is reflecting over the past 20 years of Afghan-American partnership, what was done well in the areas of counterinsurgency, 
public education, governance, community engagement, or other areas. Thank you so much for your interest and uh, thank you for that uh, important question. Starting with the counterinsurgency, what was done right, I would say, uh, number one, was providing educational opportunities for people, particularly women, and empowering women. Uh, that is normally the best form of counterinsurgency and uh, countering violent extremism leading to terrorism. Um, when they engaged the communities, they got the best results. And uh, when they focus their attention on politics or politician is when it derailed, basically. Uh, so in terms of the governance, what went right was the continuous uh, emphasis on inclusion, on capacity building, and uh, but uh, what really did, uh, uh, had a negative impact on all of it or took us to the situation that we are in is uh, lack of accountability, especially at the higher echelons of the government and leadership. Uh, providing education uh, to all, investing in education, educational sectors, particularly working in more innovative ways, in ways that was not practiced before, uh, such as partnership with the private universities, uh, providing um, job opportunities. That helped a lot in terms of uh, not only getting people educated, but the shift in terms of uh, mindset towards education. I remember in my parents' generation, for example, uh, to encourage people to attend universities, not only the universities were free, and um, everything in the university was free from books to transportation, and um, there was no tuition, but the university would even pay a stipend to the students in order to encourage them to attend. That changed to the extent that in the past 20 years, huge number of private universities flourished where they would be charging students the tuition fee and that students would come, would work during the day, pay the tuition in the evening to take those classes and to study. And that demonstrated that that, that shift in the mindset and how they were, they wanted to um, seek education. And that was because of the opportunities that arise that demonstrated that people who uh, had education, who knew how to do things professionally were valued. So these were some of the examples that went right. Thank you so much. Our next question is coming from Brooke Maynard. Brooke? Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is, did you live in Afghanistan during the first Taliban regime? If so, can you tell us about your experience during that time? The Taliban is saying that they've changed, that they aren't as extreme as before. Um, they say that women will be treated differently compared to the last time they were in power. What do you think? Do you believe that the Taliban has changed? When the Taliban took over Afghanistan the first time in the year 96, I was uh, living as a refugee in Pakistan. I mean, it's easier to say I was living as a refugee, but actually, in, in reality, we were people who had no status. We, we had just fled the war and, and we were just living there because we had nowhere else to go. Uh, it was not, we were not necessarily uh, entitled to any specific rights as refugees uh, per se. So uh, my experience living under the Taliban was in the year 98 when I returned to Afghanistan and it was a, one of my most difficult experiences. I found the city in, in a situation that I had never seen. It was just uh, filled with dust and the air was uh, uh, just uh, filled with the hopelessness and darkness and the the economy was shattered. There were uh, the women uh, were invisible, and the, uh, the men who were outside they were just 
walking and be uh, just carrying this this aura that was uh, reduced and impacted by fear. Uh, so it was a very different place that I experienced during that time than I had ever experienced. Um, women were not allowed without a burqa, and not only a burqa, but also with a male without a male escort. So for a lot of widows, it was a very complicated and difficult situation. Um, they would get lashed on the streets. Uh, the TVs would be executed on the trees if, if, the, if people were found watching them, and the, uh, the people who did watch it, the TVs or any shows through satellite and they would be imprisoned and punished. So it was it was a very difficult circumstance. Have they changed? Well, so far they are not doing what they were doing then. So, but but to pull back and just explain this from like a, a bigger perspective or a more general perspective. Number one, everybody changes. We all change. It has been 20 years. Of course, especially the Taliban leadership who had the flavor of what it uh, uh, means to stay in these five-star hotels and have uh, go to the um, global platform and to demonstrate your views and all that, uh, have taught them something. But has it trickled down to all their ranks and files, to all their different groups who have been involved in the fight over the past 20 years? I don't think that is the case. So there might have been change in the in, uh, different echelons of the Taliban, especially in the leadership, thinking, OK, so we must be a little bit more lenient. But a little bit more lenient is not is not acceptable. And we cannot say that this is good enough uh, for Afghanistan or Afghan women because it is not. Mm, the, uh, the short answer would be that they might have changed uh, somewhat. I'm not so sure that they have changed in terms of ideology. They may have changed in terms of thinking that it is in their best of interest not to be acting as harshly as they did in the first reign of their uh, power. Let's also not forget that they, in the first uh, round of their uh, reign and regime, they took over an Afghanistan that was already shattered, that people were already fed up. There was no development. Whatever Afghanistan had was looted and sold and destroyed by the years of civil war. Now they are faced with a different Afghanistan, which has been progressing for the past 20 years. So they, do, they cannot just come and act the same way. Now, from the way they are conducting themselves, it does not seem that they ideologically have made any shift and changes from what they were. They just do not think it's in their best of interest to be as harsh as they were. And the fact that they are not allowing girls to go to school under the pretext of the situation is not right or we are working on it is a clear indication that that change has not happened. Well, that is, uh, you've definitely enlightened us and what a fascinating experience you have directly had. Our next question comes from John Michael Diang. John Michael, would you join us, please? Is it working? My own. Uh, hello, Madam Ambassador. Um, I was just wondering, um, during the fall of Afghanistan, it was reported that the during the Taliban takeover, many of the provinces did not fight back against the Taliban. Um, does that show that there's an ideological problem indicating that a ruling majority in Afghanistan of sorts supports a culture that's incompatible with democratic values, particularly the values of women? Well, hello, John. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, so uh, there is uh, two questions. What, number one, whether majority of Afghanistan are supportive of a, a regime like that of Taliban 
uh, in terms of their ideology and mentality? And second, uh, why uh, the previous government collapsed so fast? Uh, and then in the, what connects these two is whether the security forces fought or not because of ideology and allowed uh, for the previous government to fall. First, let me say that the people of Afghanistan do not subscribe to what the Taliban are advocating, the form of a very severe um, uh, interpretation of Islam, which is very unique to them. It is uh, practiced in no Muslim country. It has never been part of the Afghan culture. Uh, Afghanistan is more than 99% Muslim, and, and they all uh, identify as being uh, Muslims. But they never subscribe to that kind of treatment of women or the very uh, uh, harsh uh, and severe way of uh, imposing the religion as the basis that uh, uh, they, they, they do what they are doing. So, no, it's the people of Afghanistan do not support the ideology. Now, there is one thing that you do because of ideology, another thing you have to, you are doing because of inevitability. Now this group has taken over. And even before that, uh, as they were making their way and taking control over the, the provinces, what was going on is that under their very harsh, severe treatment, people had to abide. That's an inevitability. We know of so many families who had one son working for the Afghan security forces under the previous government and another one with the Taliban because if they did not uh, basically um, allowed or, or uh, enroll their, uh, one of their sons to also be on the Taliban side, they would threaten them to kill them to kill the, the rest of the members of the family. So they, it has been out of inevitability uh, that they, uh, they have to go by. And then when they, they, they have taken over the country, they, uh, there is one specific characteristic of the Taliban that they rule by fear. Uh, and uh, people cannot necessarily uh, easily resist. Secondly, then why why this forces did not uh, resist and did not fight? It's a different question. The the, the Afghan forces uh, were uh, there, there's many reasons. Number one is that it was a, a force that voluntarily applied. Many of them uh, were there because of employment, but then after they were trained, and although they, they um, were there to defend a country, the people, they were extremely discouraged by the leadership, by the, when they watched how leadership did not care about them, they were asked to put their lives in the line, but then the commander would, for example, steal their food. That extremely demoralized them. That was one of the reasons that, that uh, contributed to the very fast collapse. Second, after the announcement was made that the forces are leaving, and then they had not seen sufficient leadership from the Afghan government, the calculation in the head of the soldiers went that I, why am I going to, why, why would I put my life in the line? I, why should I die? And what is the value that I'm preserving? I, at least if I am alive, I can feed my family or I try to feed them. So th that was the second. The third reason was that something that I have heard from numerous uh, uh, sources uh, that, uh, especially from the security uh, sector, that uh, closer to the collapse, uh, the leadership in Kabul was encouraging even some of these uh, commanders not to fight and uh, to uh, hand over. Afghanistan, Af the Afghan government 
as it neared its collapse, was really corrupted, corrupted to the uh, to the point that other than self-interest and prejudice, they saw nothing. And therefore, the collapse had become inevitable. It was not really the, the morale and the tactique or um, the, the force and discipline and all of the, the, the support of people on the side of the Taliban that made them successful. It was the failure of the uh, incumbent government that granted them the success. Thank you. Our, our next question comes from Nehor Hegels. Nehor? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Madam Ambassador. Uh, my question is regarding the Karzai International Airport bombing. Uh, in response to the bombing, the U.S. used a drone to strike on what it thought was a person involved. However, it turned out to be a worker for a U.S.-funded uh, aid organization who has, who has been out getting water at that time for his family. And in addition, the strike killed 10 people, including seven children. Uh, what impact did the deaths of innocent civilians during the last 20 years have on the people's attitude towards the Taliban? Well, um, civilian casualty was, of course, one of the major issues that was happening on both sides. Uh, I must also say that the Taliban made very good use uh, of uh, the unfortunate incidences in terms of civilian casualty, and their propaganda machine was so active that they continuously demonstrated and spoke about it and, and, and uh, motivated people to, to go against it. It was a major uh, uh, factor, basically. But there was also what uh, encouraged, uh, what, what basically um, incentivized people uh, against the government, against the, the uh, presence uh, of the, of the uh, foreign troops and all that was corruption, was inequality, was lack of accountability because Afghans were dying in one side or the other. Whether it was the bombing or whether uh, by, by a drone or an airplane or a suicide bomber um, in, in a village or in a market. Uh, unfortunately, that had become the continuous mode of life. But for those who were living and they were still there, they were suffering from inequality, from prejudice, from uh, corruption, and, and, and they were really fed up with it. Uh, so that particular incident, of course, uh, uh, in the height of people's uh, feeling of anger and betrayal and uh, panic as, as, the, as the American forces and, and the rest of the international community withdrew uh, massively, I would say, contributed uh, to uh, anti-American um, anti and anti-Western sentiments. Thank you. Our next question comes from Charlotte Kiss. Charlotte? Hello, Madam Ambassador. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, my question today is, the Taliban has expressed desire to establish relationships with other countries, including the United States. Have you seen any indications of Taliban recognition from their neighbors or any other countries? And under what circumstances do you believe a Taliban-led Afghan government should be recognized by the United States and other members of the international community? Well, I will, I will I try to answer this in reverse order and say that until the Taliban government is not, is, is the, it continues to be the Taliban government and not the people of Afghanistan's government, they should not receive recognition. It's, there is a distinction. The Taliban government or the people of Afghanistan's government? The people of Afghanistan's government would be a government that is elected by the will of the people. The people of Afghanistan over and over demonstrated their uh, resolve to democracy because Afghans have been known to be warriors and uh, reject imposition. Uh, 
an election and democracy was giving them a voice, regardless of how uh, it was conducted, but they uh, continuously demonstrated their resolve. So the government that, that has come and uh, holds power for a variety of different reasons in a in a, by imposition is not going to be a representative government. And a, rep a government that's not representative of its people and is an imposition on them should not receive the recognition of the international community. Now, um, what are the countries that potentially would uh, recognize them? I mean, there is a there are some countries that have been their supporters all along and they already demonstrate de facto recognitions. Uh, for example, Pakistan that's advocating for recognition of the Taliban, but they themselves publicly and explicitly have not announced that they are recognizing them. But they, they, they have a relationship, whatever, like de facto, there is a de facto recognition. Um, but the, uh, then uh, for the rest of the regional countries, uh, it, it is the same story that was, has been going on for the um, past several decades, which is like a hedging strategy. They, they rather have somewhat of a good relationship and, and know what is going on with the incumbent government than not to. So this is, this is basically what happens. And um, uh, I believe that the international community should continue to press on them uh, to uh, help establish a government that's representative of people. Uh, uh, Ambassador Rahmani, I have a follow-up um, regarding, you, you mentioned Pakistan, and it's the presumption by some in, that in the Pakistani government were in favor of a Taliban take order of Af takeover of Afghanistan. So what do you think about that prospect? Do you think Pakistan encouraged the Taliban to move in or even provided assistance? And even if they did, do you think it made a difference in the decision making of the Taliban leadership? Well, let's let's look at it from a uh, different angle. The Taliban leadership have always resided in Pakistan. When the negotiations were happening in Qatar, and there was a, something that they needed a decision about. The, the Afghan negotiation team would return back to Afghanistan. The Taliban negotiation team would go to Pakistan. So this is where they received their guidance and orders. And of course, you, uh, given that their uh, entire system was supported and established in Pakistan, it would it's clear that, that they, they did receive. Now, whether they were encouraged by the Pakistan to take over or not, I, I think it, uh, you, we can infer by the fact that they continuously uh, receive the support, uh, the safe havens, the um, systems and structure to be uh, to do their finances, logistics. Um, the, the structure was held together and all that, and, and, and as well as the, the madrasas that were training the fighters. Uh, in fact, and thousands of suicide bombers every year, unfortunately. That, that is a clear indication that they were. Plus, Taliban took over in claiming uh, victory. Uh, and uh, nobody said that, no, they were not victorious. And after that, if you look at the, the announcements from, from the Pakistani government, that also indicates that, that they seem that they were pleased by that takeover. So I think there is sufficient uh, indicators that, that uh, would uh, lead us to believe that they were supportive of this move. So back on the topic of, um, of rec international recognition of the Taliban, uh, can you tell us alternatives of rec alternatives to recognition that could be used to provide aid to the people of Ga Afghanistan without bolstering the uh, Taliban regime? Uh, well, 
it's one thing to deal with the government, it's another one to recognize them. So uh, in terms of dealing, for example, the United States have been dealing with them now for a couple of years. They, they negotiated directly an, an agreement with them and whether they uh, stayed, um, whether they honored the agreement or not, it's a different uh, conversation, but uh, the dealing has been there. Um, given that the Taliban are in a victory mode and uh, have uh, uh, somehow become used to getting whatever they want because they have the upper hand uh, uh, and they, they have won the war, uh, they may continue to only respond to uh, uh, some sort of relevant pressure. And other than that, they might not be willing to uh, work. So the, the modality would be that you can deal with them without having to recognize them. And if they want recognition and, and, the, and the privileges that come with that, they must also respect the will of the people. Let's move back to our students now. Our next student is Ben Hummer. Ben, would you join us and ask your question? Hi, Ambassador. Thank you so much for um, speaking with us today. Um, as you know, there have been thousands of Afghan, American, and allied armed service members injured or killed over the last 20 years um, in an effort to establish a free and peaceful Afghanistan. Um, and so in your opinion, what can be said to those individuals and their families who sacrificed so much for the cause given the current state of Afghanistan? Uh, well, as always, my message is to the veterans and their families is that we share your pain, we understand your pain, and but what is, uh, because we have experienced it, we know what it is, and there is no words that would be consoling and sufficient for you, but there is one thing that I want to share with you, that your sacrifices have not been in vain. Uh, your contribution uh, enabled international communities engagement. Uh, and then that engagement gave hope to so many people, education to so many people, uh, enabled them and empowered them to work. Uh, Afghan women for the first time broke the barriers to the extent that they never did before. And it, it is owed to your sacrifices as well as their own hard work and resilience and, and uh, the, the sacrifices of the Afghan uh, people. So it is, it's a hard time. I, I think we have all along, we have been uh, feeling connected to the veteran community and their families, but particularly now, because as they are angry, confused, and puzzled, and feel guilty and betrayed, the same goes in our heads. And, and uh, we are all grappling with trying to find meaning and then uh, ways to move on and move forward. But I just want to repeat that their sacrifices have not been in vain. And it doesn't matter what happens at the bigger picture of the political world, it is the very life of the people that they impacted. And that impact is not reversible. Thank you so much for, for those comments. Uh, we now go to Isabel Dalaba. Isabel, can you join us and ask your question? Hi, Madam Ambassador. Thank you so much for being with us today. What do you think is the most effective way for the international community, both governments and regular citizens, to help advocate for the rights of women and girls in Afghanistan? Well, thank you. Um, the best way to do it, number one, make sure that the connectivity is not lost. Because at this point, uh, the Afghan women, uh, need to be connected, their voices need to be heard. Second, as, if, as they are connected, we need to not cease paying attention to what's happening. 
uh, we need to continue to pay attention to what is going on. I know that usually the uh, life cycle in the press and media is pretty short. Things move from one issue to another, from one country to another. But then that uh, while the, the attention in media wanes, life for them still goes on and the restrictions increase. So let's not cease paying attention. Let's continue to advocate and let's make sure that they are connected. Secondly, let's uh, we really need to devise and think out of the box of the strategies that to empower communities and have women's leadership in it. Um, now it looks like that that uh, because of the uh, boiling human catastrophe that that is happening in Afghanistan, that the the uh, attention is shifted to humanitarian assistance, but. We should not settle for just getting people enough to survive and not die from hunger or cold, uh, which is essential. But with that, also think about how we could um, have a, a distribution system that empowers communities, that, that have women in the leadership, that, that because empowering them is empowering communities. And the empowering communities is the way forward. It is, it is what would be sponsoring real peace? Thank you. So we all we all witnessed the rapid collapse of the Afghan government. What do you think the United States government could have done differently during the last 20 years uh, that might have created greater peace and stability and potentially a, a different outcome? Two things mainly. Consistency and accountability. Let me explain that. Um, consistency because uh, the in any negotiation, in any situation, if you already tell your next move to your opponent, a very harsh and stubborn opponent, <clears throat> defeat is guaranteed. Uh, the departure of the US troops was announced in 2014 like, uh, sorry, 2010, over a decade ago. So um, the, the, that contributed to even worsening the situation in terms of the governance, in terms of security, in terms of corruption, in terms of violations, and, and so much more. So uh, if there was a more consistent policy that, what was needed and how they wanted, whether they wanted to reach a um, peaceful um, uh, settlement or a negotiation that should have started much earlier, not when you were almost out of the door or out of the door and then asking the other party that let's go and share power because that was never in the courts. Second, accountability, because the, the Afghan government and the leadership that, that was there, especially increasingly, especially in the, in the past year or two, it, it got exponentially self-centric, self-interested, um, prejudiced, uh, to the point that, that uh, nobody, uh, it was it was impossible like the collapse was absolutely inevitable because the um, uh, entire faith of millions of people was outsourced to two or three people who felt completely in charge and entitled and they were extremely prejudiced so that the, the tolerance towards such attitude and then um, just working with them contributed to what we are seeing today. So we've we've heard reports that many in Afghanistan, of course, women, Hazara, the Hazara minority groups and others uh, who worked with the American government are in hiding due to Taliban reprisals. Um, or the fear of them. And I'm sure you've been in touch with many people in this situation. How, how are people surviving during these most difficult circumstances? Well, the, 
the word itself describes it. You are using survive. Survive is just like staying alive, trying to make the day. And this is what they are doing without necessarily being able to plan and know what the future holds. They are trying to make it through the day. It is not only insecurity and the fear that dominates their world. It's also lack of opportunities, lack of employment, deteriorating economic situation, drought, uh, disease, the human catastrophe that is looming there. All of it is pressing people continuously and daily. The consequences of which would be generational. And it, it needs immediate attention, but it is real, it's true. And this is what survival means. It is imminent, it is today, it's now. Uh, this next question is, is might be connected. Um, Kabul had a vibrant NGO community, both within Afghanistan and, and from abroad. This was particularly the case when, when we were in Afghanistan back in 2011, 2012. Can you tell us the circumstances of the NGO community today in Afghanistan? Uh, well, yes, uh, Afghanistan civil society flourished uh, quite uh, dramatically over the past 20 years. People learned a lot. They, uh, and there was opportunities and motivations uh, with the uh, flow of aid, particularly initially in the earlier years when I returned, and uh, it was um, uh, the number of NGOs were growing uh, by day, uh, and uh, because there was uh, uh, economic incentives, employment incentives, and much more. But then uh, throughout the years. Uh, they got self through some of them stayed, some of them closed down, and, and but still, it, the, the civil society was very sizable, very significant. Now, uh, there is um, a range of factors that is pressing them. Uh, insecurity, of course, is one, and the um, fear of uh, being uh, arrested and uh, um, even punished, killed, imprisoned uh, is is looming there for them, uh, and and the very function that the civil society has is uh, under threat, because the civil society, by nature, is not expected to advocate for government, but generally and usefully they are very. Uh, a critical arm of the society where they point to the blames and the problems that the uh, government is experiencing. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, with the, the kind of regime that the Taliban have, that the, um, uh, the instruments of violence and fear that is that's their uh, uh, ultimate uh, instrument and, and utility, uh, it's very difficult for them to uh, function. In addition, the, uh, when there is no, not a functioning, uh, functioning economy or no economy per se, no market uh, in Afghanistan, which is the situation right now, it's difficult for civil society also to continue to function. But in fact, their function is still very critical and essential for addressing um, a whole range of issues. Absolutely. <clears throat> so it, it appears that the people of Afghanistan are probably entering a long period of struggle. Is there room for hope? What is, what is your hope for, for the short term and the long term for Afghanistan? Uh, well, if we don't have hope, I would say uh, that's it. We are dead. We only cannot have hope when we are dead. Uh, what is uh, my hope for the short term is uh, uh, that we continue to pay attention, we continue to support the Afghan people. And my hope is that 
the severe and harsh treatment imposed on the people of Afghanistan will not be internalized by them, that they can sustain the gains and shifts that they achieved over the past 20 years. In the long term is that the investments of the past 20 years, the human capital that we made, and most, more importantly, the women of Afghanistan, which is one of the most, the, the greatest and most tangible achievements that the international community had, uh, which was their empowerment, uh, would uh, be at works and would uh, take Afghanistan to its next phase, where real peace, peace can be achieved. Uh, and peace is not when the guns are silenced and people are dying quietly out of fear. That is not a peaceful society. A peaceful society would be only uh, achieved when it is reflective of all its people's uh, views, uh, aspirations, and the opportunities that they can demonstrate it. Well, Madam Ambassador, um, I think you're giving us a uh, an outlook that that isn't all gloom and doom. I, I really appreciate you and uh, your uh, you you have shared so much with us today that is direct and true. Uh, yet I'm somehow leaving with, I think, more hope than I, I arrived here with. And I hope members of our audience are as well. Are there any parting comments that you would like to share with our audience before, before we go? Well, that would be just building on what you said. And it is that um, I repeat a saying uh, that I always hang on to. And it is the pessimism is the weapon of the powerful. We cannot afford it. And I need your help, your uh, all of uh, your advocacy to continue to pay attention uh, and help us keep our uh, voice alive. Give us a space for this voice to be continued, but uh, make sure that this hope will sustain that this it is not easy for the people of afghanistan as uh, you are saying that i am i sound hopeful but this is also a mechanism for all of us to cope with what is happening while people are literally starving and dying this is not an acceptable situation this is not an acceptable situation where in this era and century young Afghan girls are told that they cannot attend schools. Uh, I think it is a responsibility and it's a shared responsibility uh, for all of us to pay attention to do something. Uh, so we will stay hopeful, but also we need to stay realistic for this hope to sustain for this hope to mean anything, we need to take action. Ambassador Rahmani, you've, uh, while you may not officially be the ambassador, you are totally the ambassador uh, of the spirit of Afghanistan. And we thank you so much. I thank you for being with us today. And uh, the, Afghanistan is a nation of, of wonderful, friendly people. And that's something that we cannot forget. And like you say, we will not, we will not lose hope and we will continue working for a better day for our, for our friends uh, in, your, in your wonderful country. So thank you so much for your time here today. And we hope to see you again soon. I do want to uh, briefly mention that uh, this Saturday is the conference. It's news, propaganda, and, di and diplomacy. So if you will, if our audience would like to join us from 9:30 to 12:45, we would love to see you there. And once again, Ambassador Rahmani, thank you so much, and we hope to see you again soon.